let me say that again. Get it fluently. Welcome to Whitehall. We're not accustomed to having press conferences at Whitehall, but it was always the intention to have the ability to do that. So now that we have that ability, I have to become accustomed to saying welcome to Whitehall. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you would recall, um, usually when I travel, I would meet with the media sometimes at the airport on the way back. But given the times of return, um, has not, I have not been able to do that. So I take the opportunity this morning to bring you up to speed on what you might have been wanting to engage me on, which is this visit of a very large delegation from Trinidad and Tobago to Washington. I led a delegation against the following background. When I became prime minister of this country, I took the position that given the number of urgent issues and significant issues that required the attention of the government, my approach had been and continues to be that the government of Trinidad and Tobago through the office of the prime minister would engage these issues at the top, not through any middlemen or any local officer of international agencies. I will engage them at the location where the decisions are made. That approach, you would have seen me engaging Shell, BP, EOG, BHP, all of them at their boardrooms where decisions are made. As a result of that, we have been able to short circuit a lot of the circuitous travel between our interests and the interests of others. And we were able to get done a number of things which were very important for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but might not have been that important to middlemen and so on. I speak specifically here about, for example, our ability to talk directly to the Australians in Melbourne about the ruby oil field, our ability to talk to the Prime Minister of Australia about getting two ferries and two Coast Guard um, coastal patrol craft. All of these were done in what in effect were record time. In fact, in the case of the ferries and the, the ferries in particular for Tobago and Trinidad, we were able to literally jump the queue. Had we waited in the normal scheme of things, even if we had the money in hand, we would have been about two or three years in that line. We got those ferries done, even with COVID, and the delays in COVID, we got those ferries done in record time. And similarly, we were the first country, Trinidad and Tobago was the first country to have access to the Australian export funding for defense equipment when we got those two coastal vessels, CG-41 and CG-42, again, in record time. We were able also to engage without interfering with the contracts that were in place in the petrochemical sector and the LNG sector. We were able to engage the multinationals, Shell and BP. And from those negotiations and discussions which flowed from convincing them that we had issues to address, while they could easily have, and they did take the position that they were following their contracts, we were able to extract billions of dollars in additional revenue, which we otherwise would not have had, had we not engaged these companies at the top. I think the figure is 13 mil, about $17 billion. $17 billion in additional revenue, which had we not engaged those entities without breaking contracts, without threatening to break contracts, we got that because of how we approached it. We also ended up with increased investment in our hydrocarbon basin within our borders. It's in that context that I engaged the Venezuelan government with respect to Trinidad and Tobago, accessing their gas field and also getting Venezuela to agree to tear up the unitization approach 
to Laurent Banati, which was going on for 15 years with no progress, and to allow Trinidad and Tobago, where we own 27% of that gas field, to allow us to proceed to develop that field and to extract our portion of the gas and not wait for any unitization because unitization meant that Venezuela had to agree to extract theirs in an arrangement with us, and for 15 years we couldn't get that agreement. In one year, we got the approval to move forward, and you would know that Shell as the operator on that field has issued its instructions to McDermott to proceed to prepare to develop that field. So the nearest on-border and across-border um, field that we are working on is, Laurent, is Manatee, from Laurent Manatee. But with, Jar with Dragon, which is entirely within Venezuelan territorial waters, we approached Venezuela at the top, the office of the president, of the government of Venezuela, and proposed to them that Point Lisas should be their export location. And of course, we worked with Shell to get them to agree to work with NGC on the pipeline in the event that Venezuela agrees with us. And we did get the historic agreement where Venezuela, for the first time, agreed to have its gas exported against the background where, for decades, they were talking about doing their own petrochemical and LNG business. So that generated the dragon as a location in the hydrocarbon basin for Trinidad and Tobago to support its petrochemical complex. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say, it's a little depressing when I see citizens of Trinidad and Tobago jumping up and down and cheering every time they think that we have lost what they call the dragon deal. I want to say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago this morning, this has nothing to do with my legacy. It has to, everything to do with the future of the children of Trinidad and Tobago. Because the reason why I, as Prime Minister, and my government paid so much attention and put so much effort, not singly operating in this way, but as part of our overall effort, but one of the reasons why we put so much effort into this is that if we do not get an improved supply of gas to point 14 and point leases, I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago today, even those who believe that Trinidad and Tobago is not a real place, just think of where we are going to be in five years or seven years or 10 years if we are unable to sustain our earnings from the hydrocarbon sector. And those earnings are largely sustained from the gas sector because we have become a gas producing and a petrochemical producing nation. Without the raw material, where will Trinidad and Tobago's economy be? Because every other aspect of our economy, whether it is banking, whether it is education, whether it is construction, whether it is foreign affairs, every single aspect is dependent on success in the revenue earning side of the country. And to sustain a revenue level that will maintain the quality of life that we had come to know, a quality of life which has been sustained, bolstered, and encouraged by revenues from the hydrocarbon sector. If we don't have that, then clearly, have to have something else. That is why we have been putting out effort as well. Only last week, we, last uh, six weeks ago, we opened up the Phoenix Park manufacturing sector area, the, the Phoenix Park complex, where we expect to do more in manufacturing, we expect to do more in agriculture, we're doing the shade houses for young people and so on. All these things we're doing. But on the immediate and medium term and long term revenue, our future still is heavily dependent on success in the hydrocarbon sector. And that is why when I see people, especially people writing editorials, so happy to announce 
that because of geopolitical changes, that our efforts would have come to naught, and I told you so. I wonder if these people have any good wishes for Trinidad and Tobago. What are our main issues requiring the attention of the government in Trinidad and Tobago in the context of our immediate and our medium term and our long term? Issue number one, safety and security. And it's against that background that we are all concerned and disturbed and annoyed about crime and criminality and violence in our country, from our schools to our business places, from our homes to the bars. We as a nation, we have a problem with crime and criminality and violence in general. We also have an issue of our borders, notwithstanding all the resources we put out there. There are people who every night try to penetrate our borders, and some succeed. And therefore, we need to be cognizant of that, and that is one of the focus for of the government. We also have to deal with this whole question of energy security, because it is in that context that we talk about our effort in dealing with oil companies and the government that owns resources that we have our eyes on. Against that background, we, in the last few years, have focused on building relationships and identifying the decision makers where they are. And recently, I've had to go to the United States on our timetable, heavily supported by an ambassador who is very invested in the interests of Trinidad and Tobago, very proactive ambassador, who has worked very closely with us on all these issues. And I want to say um, we are very grateful for the effort that's coming from that direction and the cooperation that we're having between our staff and US government staff. So I led a delegation to Washington on Sunday, and that delegation included ministers who covered the various areas that I've just mentioned. In that delegation was the Minister of Energy, who also carries the portfolio of minister in the office of, of the Prime Minister. And that's an important por portfolio because Minister Young's portfolio as minister in the office of the Prime Minister allows the office of the Prime Minister to do a lot more at any one time because he represents my office in many of these discussions where the prime ministerial office is where the conversations take place and decisions are made. And Minister Young was in that delegation. As a matter of fact, he went ahead of me to ensure that when I got there, certain things were in place. Um, I had also Minister Amy Brown, who is our foreign and CARICOM minister, who also is engaged very heavily. His portfolio is very heavily involved in these matters. I had Minister Bacchus, who incidentally, at the time of this meeting, this, this delegation being in Washington, Minister Bacchus had just led an operational delegation to India. We, as you know, we're working very closely with India, who is helping us with our digitization. And Minister Bacchus and his team, they had two appointments in India, one in Delhi and one in Bangalore. He was there leading the team to Delhi, and he left um, someone else in charge, the Bangalore leg, and he joined us in Washington because it was very important for the Minister of Digital Transformation to be involved in the discussions and the exposures that we were facing in Washington. And of course, I had with me the Chief of Defense Staff uh, and some other personnel from cybersecurity because these were issues that we were going to be meeting with the United States authorities on. So it was a full delegation covering these areas of interest and importance to Trinidad and Tobago. I was able to meet with and hold discussions with the following people. Vice President Kamala Harris, and this is one of the many times I've met with her. We have an ongoing arrangement since the Summit of the Americas 
President Biden put a, um, something in place where I'm co-chairing with her on the energy matter. Secretary, and, uh, for, uh, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, who you all would have met here when he came for the 50th anniversary of CARICOM. Senior defense officials, including the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Melissa Dalton. We met for the first time in my going to Washington on these matters, Exim Bank President and Chair of the Board of Directors, Rita Joe Lewis, and we had some very interesting discussions there, with, out of which would come additional resource possibilities for Trinidad and Tobago in its economic development. The U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, who is very eager to encourage Trinidad and Tobago business sector to take advantage and more advantage of what exists in the present, um, what you commonly used to call the CBI arrangement. There are opportunities and facilities for, 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 for Trinidad and Tobago private sector to access certain things which the U.S. is indicating that we are not taking advantage of, largely from the private sector. I also met with National Security Council Senior Director for the Western Hemisphere, Juan Gonzalez, who, if you know that name, that is the individual who has been with us ahead of, and, and representing the United States in all its dealings with Venezuela on the matters that I mentioned a bit earlier on. And we did have a, a renewed meeting with the senior Democrats, led by Hakeem Jeffries, who is, you know, is the uh, Democratic leader, minority leader in the House, with a delegation of um, congressmen and women, some of whom had been to Trinidad and Tobago at least once before in these. Um, I could mention Congresswoman Maxine Waters. You may recall she was the one who we met with way back when we had when we initially responded to the crisis in the risking and bank corresponding banking, when our banking communities in CARICOM were being expelled from the American and other banking systems. Congresswoman Maxine Waters took it upon herself as chair of the Finance Committee to hold hearings in Washington, and Minister um, Mia Motley and myself attended those hearings. We made our case to the Congress, and before that, um, she came down to CARICOM here. We met in Barbados and she guided us and they take this issue up. And while the issue has not disappeared or evaporated, it's still a threat there. The conditions have emerged, has uh, evolved uh, considerably in our favor, where the pressure is a little off, and the pace at which we were being de-risked and debunked um, has, has uh, receded. Um, she was there, the congressman, Gregory Meeks, you may recall, um, he was, he's the minority, he's the ranking person in foreign affairs in the United States, and in the event that they, there's a change in the House makeup in November, uh, he becomes a, a chair of the U.S. foreign relations. He's also an expert on Latin America and the Caribbean, so we're very happy for that. He has been with us from day one in our missions to Washington. Congressman Benny Thompson, who was supposed to be leading a delegation here in March of 2020, but we closed the country one week before that delegation was due here. And um, that, is, that is still on the card, so we may, very, we may still have that delegation, but he's also the ranking member on Homeland Security. Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who is very keen in following Caribbean uh, and Trinidad and Tobago's effort in Washington. Uh, and Stephen Hosford and James Clyburn, you know James Clyburn from South Carolina, who is mm -hmm. one of the uh, patriarchs of American politics at this time. We have built quite good relationship with him. And William Crasco, who is um, piloting a bill in the US Parliament to get legislation to deal with the um, matters of uh, firearms trafficking and the effect that it's having on people like us. So that bill is on its way. Um, you know how these things go if you're familiar with the United States system. The bill is sponsored by members of the House and they have to build support to get it to the floor. So um, Julian Castro has been here with us in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, he's part of the group that we talked to in Washington. He was there. 
in this meeting. We also met um, with officials of the FBI. We do have some problems in Trinidad and Tobago here, which I will not burden you with today, but we do have some internal problems. And um, given the nature of our relationship with the United States, the resources of the FBI and the CIA are made available to us to deal with our, our own internal problems. Um, we met with officials of the Department of Homeland Security who will give us a listening ear with respect to what we might need to assist in certain matters. And we met with senior officials from the State Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy. We spent Wednesday, Tuesday morning um, in Langley in a workshop with these people because you in media more than anybody should know where we are, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but where the world is with respect to cyber security and insecurity, cyber penetration, uh, you know, the, 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 the criminality in cyberspace, as well as the dangers of the untruths of AI and the ability of AI to convert and make it difficult for even leaders and governments to determine what is true and what is not true. I mean, we have reached a stage now where the use of AI platforms without any input from the profession or the vocation, the platform can pass the, the bar exams. The, part, the platform can pass medical exams. And of course, given the positives of the technology, there are a whole lot of negatives that we have to now confront. And so we will, we spent the morning on that and it was very great eye opener. And you would know, um, some of you, those of you who follow our um, effort in managing our safety and security, that the United States government funds several security cooperation programs in Trinidad and Tobago, where our law enforcement agencies are involved with them. And we'll continue to do that and while we work very closely with the United States to further enhance and strengthen the capabilities of local uh, law enforcement officials. Um, some of the things that came out of what we, can, we, we are doing, we're going to be doing is assistance in policing strategies to boost crime fighting and citizen security, working on specialized and vetted units to investigate organized crime, because we are now attracting elements of international organized crime, which is very concerning to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So we are discussing this with the United States to get as much help as we can in ensuring that our bad situation is not worsened by these developments. We have made plans and the U.S. has agreed to help us with uh, increased marine operations. So we'll be working on that in the coming weeks to see what we can get out of that. Um, the whole question that arose at an earlier time of the establishment of a gun crime intelligence unit and operational demonstration of what we've been able to accomplish since we've been out there talking about these gun crimes and the flow of arms and ammunition from the U.S. into us. So this, this gun crimes in intelligence unit is one of the priority areas of cooperation between us and the United States. And of course, we intend to establish a cyber security bilateral technical working group, which would offer institutional technical exchanges and digital transformation support for our people here in Trinidad and Tobago, working closely with their colleagues. And that is why Minister Bacchus and people from cybersecurity here was on this group, making the person-to-person -person contact with the people who will work with us on these issues. And of course, we have the US support with respect to the whole question of technical exchanges and coming up with successful strategies for energy transition and climate adaptation. We are operating like on the basis that the efforts at fighting carbon control as a response to the 
existential threat of climate change, that we are working in a transitional period towards some time when those carbon volumes in the atmosphere would be such that we'd be net zero. But until such time as we get there, we consider that to be a transitional um, assignment. And that is why we will continue to sell methanol as the clean fuel. We'll continue to sell LNG as a substitute for coal. And we'll continue to uh, try to green our point leases petrochemical areas to be more and more in sync with what the international effort is with respect to climate change. So if you, if you think you see any dichotomy between us wanting to be a hydrocarbon exporter and producer, you also should see us as a nation that is working towards greening our business. So we are in there on both sides. We also sought help and got commitments for funding for sustain, sustainable energy. You know, we are we're currently constructing 113 megawatts of solar power. We intend to do more of that. Um, and the funding for that is something that we have been working towards because Sri Lanka and Tobago has very limited funding on these matters. They're expensive, and our priorities use up much of what we have in hand. And we don't have free capital to go big in saying that we're going to shift to our 80% or 50% on, on cyber power and um, on solar power. But we're going to go, we're aiming to get to 30%. So we're now looking at 10% and over in the, in the next two to three years, maybe we'll add more and get to that 30% target. And we would be well within our contribution to the international matters. We also, in most of our discussions, as a leader in CARICOM, the United States raised with us um, our, our position on and involvement in the calamitous situation in Haiti, which is, you would have, if you were following CARICOM, you would have seen the Trinidad and Tobago and CARICOM's position on Haiti. And we have committed to working together to strengthen the international rules-based system, where today we acknowledge that Haiti does not have a single elected official. Haiti is the largest population within CARICOM. It's a CARICOM nation, and that situation is very troublesome, even embarrassing to all of us. But we believe in Trinidad and Tobago that there's a requirement. We didn't make it clear to the United States that there's a requirement for United States leadership in this matter, and that the United States cannot wash its hand of Haiti. And in fact, if we are in fact the true Democrats that we claim to be, we should be concerned that Haiti does not have even a semblance of democracy. And uh, we cannot turn the blind eye to Haiti while we try to perfect Venezuela. And of course, Trinidad and Tobago's position at CARICOM and with the United States is that the current administration in Haiti needs to make room for the evolution of a trajectory towards an election timetable and indicator, an indication that any outside assistance to Haiti cannot be reasonably assumed to be propping up of the existing regime. That is Trinidad and Tobago's position, and we made that very clear to the United States. And I think they understand it, and CARICOM understands it as well. So that is where we are. Trinidad and Tobago's delegation, we had three days of very exhausting and exhaustive discussions with the decision makers in the United States, from the office of the president through the various departments and the office holders who advised the president and the vice president. Uh, we, I want to mention something here just in case I forget. While I was abroad, I saw somebody from the opposition in one of their press conferences. While they were crowing about the loss of the dragon, they were talking about some hundred million dollar pipeline from dragon to hibiscus. I want to make it abundantly clear that I know that game. I have been in this matter from its conception to now, 
I have never seen a document anywhere, and I have never seen a quotation on the cost of that pipeline. But what I do know, and anybody who knows anything of this issue who should be commenting on it would know that a pipeline from Dragon to Hibiscus cannot be seen in the context of $100 million. These are usually extremely expensive pieces of infrastructure, and that is why they require the kinds of foundation that we have laid because we know that significant investment would be required to bring it to reality. That figure thrown out there is a figure of mischief. And they know very well that that is not anywhere near the cost of that pipeline. But what they intend to do, and I'm putting a marker here down today, if this is left unattended, is that they put that lie out there. And when the real figure comes out, they then will be able to say, come up with all kinds of conspiracy theories between the two figures. I want to let you know today that there's absolutely no basis. And you must ask them where they got that figure from. Whose figure that is? That is a figure that is put there, right? To undermine the effort and to tarnish the work that we are doing now. Because when the real figure comes in, I guarantee to you, it is not going to be anywhere near $100 million. And none of us in the government or in any of the companies have ever mentioned the figure for the pipeline because we have not yet got to that stage. Right? They jump ahead of us and put that out there to you. And the next thing I will see is somebody in, the, in, in an editorial quoting it as though it has some, some merit. Right? So just put that your marker down there. We have not yet established the cost of that pipeline. We have built pipelines in the, in, in, across this country out to our, our facilities in the ocean. As a matter of fact, Trinidad and Tobago was in the forefront of building a big pipeline when we built our pipeline, our cross-island pipeline. We are in Ghana now, right, working with the Ghanaians on pipeline business. So we know the pipeline business. And when it's time to cost the pipeline, we will know what the pipeline should cost. And it is a sorry, But those of us who want to see good for Trinidad and Tobago, we will ensure that our effort is not smeared by those who have other objectives. So ladies and gentlemen, those are the issues. But I want to make one other point as I talk about the pipeline. Against the background of what the editorial writers try to put here, while we were abroad. Yes, the United States has its sanctions on Venezuela. It is because we know that, and we've seen that, and the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago is aware of the ramifications of that, why we have engaged this issue in the way that we have. So, when the United States government issued its general license number 44, that global general license to all and sundry, that did not limit or dampen the enthusiasm of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to proceed along the path that we had started on. I told you early on, we were not prepared to talk to go-betweens and juniors. From day one, we did not put our argument or our expectation on the general license number 44, which expires on the 1st of April, on the 18th of April, actually, um, which is a few weeks from now. Those who rely on that general license to do business with Venezuela, that expiry is their problem. We never relied on that, otherwise we would have been in that situation. From day one, we took a different path. We sought through the Office of Foreign Asset Control to get what we call a carve-out. And that OFAC license that we got in January 2023 is a license for 
two years, we have that. So we are not, and we have got that confirmation from this meeting in Washington, we are not directly affected by the 18th of April activity. But of course, the US government can change its position anytime. Because those of you who follow US politics, you would see by the hour what is happening with the United States about its own business, passing its own budget, right? It's turmoil, that's the word I would use. So changes can come. But we have believed that some of these matters could survive, right? And we are surviving. We also got, when we got that OFAC license, we went to Caracas. And the license initially had a rider, which was unacceptable to Venezuela. Of course, the minority in Trinidad and Tobago who wanted to see it fail were jumping up and down and saying that Maduro will never accept Maduro. We went back to Venezuela. We engaged Venezuela. We engaged Washington. And we eventually got to a situation where that rider was removed, con new, uh, conditions that were acceptable for forward progress was had, and we got an amended license. A specific, on October 17, 2023, we got a license which expires on October 31st, 2025. So that aspect, that's where our, that's where our situation is. And with respect to operational things, Jargon Field, we have in place in our hand an exploration and production license for 30 years on that field. Those are the facts and the outcome of the work of the government of Trinidad and Tobago in a very, very difficult situation. So that's what it is. And I'm sorry to announce to those who would love to see the dragon dead, Trinidad and Tobago is alive and well and has a government that looks out for the interests of all the people of Trinidad and Tobago, especially our children. Because those of us who enjoy the fruits of the last two or three decades could afford to talk stupidness now. I am concerned about the children who are grown up in this country, who are in high school today, and who deserve in the next five to 10 to 15 to 20 years to have at least what we had from our country. And that is my legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, last year I addressed you from a podium like this in a similar circumstance. Because it hasn't been easy. When it's not COVID, it's gas. When it's not gas, it's back pay. When it's not back pay, it's lies. I addressed all of them. And I said to you last year that I intended to go on a vacation last year. I did not. I said to you I intended to go on my medical examination. I did not. I'm saying to you again, no. I am going on a vacation, and I am going to do my medical. But before I do that, we have two very important meetings in Venezuela. There's the Venezuela, sorry, Guyana. There's the Guyana Energy Conference, where I'll be participating immediately after Carnival. And there is the CARICOM meeting, which is immediately on top of that. I have the option to go and come and go again. I will not be doing that. I go to Guyana for the energy conference, and I will remain there for a few days into the CARICOM heads of government meeting. We have some very weighty matters at the CARICOM heads of government meeting, and Trinidad and Tobago's presence at the Guyana energy, energy conference is a priority for the, for the cabinet. So I'll be in Guyana for a few days after cabinet, I think I probably leave, I think it's the 18th, some day like that, but I'll be up there. you'll be advised. When I come back from Guyana, I will be leaving the country on private business, my long-awaited vacation, it is being arranged right now, and I could tell you, it involves my wife, who's on retirement, and I'll be away for about 10 days, and that is why. And when I come back from that, I get back engaged into work. I've got some interesting matters in the parliament that I intend to participate in. You'll be advised appropriately. And then sometime towards April, I'm now going through my local medical assessment. 
and I would be probably doing my external medicals towards the end of April. But we do have some interesting matters in the parliament, which will not be affected by my absence. And as I tell you, you know, a lot goes on on the phone that you have. So even though I will not be here in person, I will be here in spirit. So ladies and gentlemen, having said that to you, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Um, let me start with Prior. Yeah, prior, how was going to be me if I finish? Good morning, Prime Minister. Prior, we are easy at the news. Um, me one second, Prior. Let me just have some more talk. Just one second. Let, let's start with, with lies. I uh, know, 44. Um, uh, given all that has taken place, when then do you see first gas from Dragon? I don't want to be the one to answer that because I, I tell you, Shell is the operator, right? And you, you wouldn't see first gas until you hear that we've done the assessment of the field, because the field has to be assessed. That, that is the very next thing that's going on. You will see it step by step. The assessment of the field, then you will see a program of um, drilling that would be announced. Then you would see information about what I mentioned, that the pipeline, it's because it's only in that context that first gas will become you know, reality. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next year. But it, what it does, by having what we have done now, the documentation now that is in place, that triggers the approval of the investment to be spent on the works. That's how it goes in the industry. Right? So right now, because of what we have been able to achieve with the restructuring of LNG and the documentation with the, to use the Venezuelan field and Manatee, we have un unlocked billions of dollars of investment in Trinidad and Tobago. Right? But the actual molecule doesn't appear for a few months. Is it 36 months, 24 months? It's more like 36 months. Yeah. Dr. Rowley, Keisha yes. Nins, Guardian Media. <clears throat> you, you said something earlier that had me uneasy since you said it. Uh, in your relation to your meeting with the FBI and CIA, you said, we have, I'm paraphrasing you, we have some internal problems here that I don't want to burden you with. And then you went on to talk about international organized crime. I think... I'd like to be burdened with it. What exactly are you worried about that it had you looking a little uneasy, quite frankly? We are an open country um, in international trade, international contact, and even outside of our official entry points, what we have been discovering is that um, certain criminals are liking us, and these are not small timers. I say no more on that. I, 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 I would go into no more details at this time. These are matters of national security which ought to better be kept where they are for the moment. I'm glad you raised that. You, you spoke about a very large delegation and a lot of it was on national security and your national security minister was not there. There's a former national security minister, but the substantive national security minister... National was security minister was, there, was tied up to his eyeball at home. Well, the Prime Minister and the former Minister of National Security was present abroad. So I think that's a good balance. But should, shouldn't he have been there? I feel like, because when a lot of these things would directly affect him and he's playing catch-up, so to speak. really. We are, we, um, in, in, the, in the government of Trinidad and Tobago, we have our, what is called the Division of Labor, very clear. The Minister of National Security was here. As a, as a matter of fact, I had to see him um, in a matter of hours based on what he was doing while I was away. Um, and I see you had a wonderful time with that, too. So that, the, the absence of the Minister of National Security from a foreign trip is not a, 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 an impediment. Not any foreign trip. Any foreign trip had a lot of national security implications. Um, in fact, the, the, the person who, the Minister of, Minister Bacchus, who was um, more directly involved in it than the Minister of National Security, and that's why he, he had to come back from India meet us in Washington, and he will continue some discussions in the coming weeks and months and some actions in the coming weeks and months. And of course, I did have the CDS, um, who didn't just come to, to wear his uniform. Right? Uh, this is the closest that the Trinidad government has been with the US government and Washington in general for a very long time, but my memory at least. 
Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a good point. I think I want to expand a little bit on just for the benefit. What's the key point before I forget? This didn't happen by accident. Let me just tell you all what happened in Los Angeles, at the Los Angeles meeting, Summit of the Americas. Remember that meeting that took place in 2019? Sorry, 2022. CARICOM, at the level of CARICOM, where we are facing as a region and as a body, a lot of what I raise here with you in the context of Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of it could easily be said to be the CARICOM issues. And so upset were many CARICOM governments on the lack of notice and response from our powerful neighbor to the north that some people thought that we should, there was a point of view that we should not go to that meeting. Trinidad and Tobago took the position that we're better off always inside making our case than being outside protesting. And Trinidad and Tobago led in CARICOM to ensure that every single one of the heads got to that meeting. We got to the meeting, and when we got to LA, and we looked at the program, it was not to our satisfaction. And there was a point of view that we should go home. Trinidad and Tobago and one or two other governments held the peace, and we met with the President of the United States in short order, that we had more than one contact. We had lunch with the president, and we, we had a working lunch. And the president and the vice president met with us and laid down new contact arrangement between CARICOM and the United States. That's where it started. And you would have seen the outcome of that. You would have seen at our crime symposium, where crime was noticed as a public health issue, you would have seen the U.S. response to that. You would have seen the U.S. at our CARICOM 50th anniversary, where a delegation of high-ranking U.S. officials, including the Secretary of State, was here. And you would have seen the kinds of contacts that I've just outlined. So we have had, as you correctly put it, in the last 24 months, better and more direct contact with the United States to deal with our business, both national and regional, than we have had in my time in public life. So that is true. Which brings me to my question. In 11 months, mm -hmm. you could be looking at another Trump administration. How does... Mm -hmm. 11 months. Well, let, let's put it this way, right? Let's put it this way, right? Oh. It matters not who is in office in the United States. We will have to deal with the government of the United States. And we do not interfere in picking horses for the American people. But is it worrying? It worries me. Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago was a colony. And we survived that. So now we are an independent nation requiring to be responsible, competent, and effective. So it shouldn't worry us. It should call us to ensuring that we have the capacity and the groundwork to deal with whoever is in office. Right? So we are not going to be too troubled by that. Of course, we have our ideas of what we would like to have. We don't go around telling people. We, we vote in Puerto Rico. We don't vote in America. But we have a strong diaspora. Then that is not unnoticed. So whatever the outcome of the election is in the United States, we will still have our work to do. Right? As a matter of fact, we have well, in my, some of my earlier visits, we did meet with quite a number of Republicans on these very issues. And um, in fact, in some cases, they were out front in supporting some of the things that we, for example, um, we had Republicans who were very keen on our production of ammonia which is a fertilizer raw material. And in states where the production of food, agriculture is big. The people, Republican politicians are keen in ensuring that Trinidad and Tobago spare capacity is used. Um, at one time, the price of ammonia went sky high for a little while. And um, we, we, so we, we are not 
out there picking favorites. We do have friends all around. And that just puts us in a better position. I mean, you know, you talk to Americans. We have, we have friends in China. We have friends in Europe. We have friends in Australia. And that is what Trinidad and Tobago is all about. Yes. Dr. Ali Jesse Ramlew, CNC3 Guardian Media. Um, staying with matters of national importance. Um, while you were away, there was a, a joint select committee on Wednesday involving the police commissioner where she would have admitted that, you know, the 2023-11 targets set out for 2023 were not met, unfortunately, um, you know, and she would have indicated some of her struggles, even, you know, conceding that her first year in office has been challenging. Um, what would you say to that, and what's your position? Are there any concerns at this time, given what's been said? Let me put it this way. That calls for a whole press conference by itself. I have given you so much today that is so important to the people of Trinidad and Tobago that I would not want to color it with anything else. But I want to invite you to a press conference on national security on Tuesday morning at 10.30. Let's talk national security on Tuesday morning. Yeah. So, Joel Brown, TV6 News. Yes, so, going back to the issue of uh, gas, Venezuela, and so on. Just for clarification, so you made a very clear distinction in terms of the license uh, allowing the exploitation of the gas from Venezuela and the wider clause uh, that the U.S. had been talking about that expires in April. If, in fact, the conditions that the U.S. would like to see in Venezuela are not met, and that wider regime is then those sanctions are uh, reinstituted, does that affect in terms of the sale of gas or persons or companies interested in the sale of the gas, or is that a separate thing? Um, I'm not sure I understand the, 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 the kernel of your question. Can I, can I rephrase? Yeah, please. All right. So in other words, uh, you were saying that in terms of the the, the present license, Trinidad and Tobago, Venezuela, and the exploitation of the gas and the top of the pipeline and so on. I'm just wondering, in terms of the wider regime, if in fact that is reinstituted, uh, in, if, in other words, then if the U.S. does not re renew that license, the wider license, does that affect the ability of Trinidad and Tobago and GC uh, to sell or get persons interested in buying the gas whenever that gas uh, is brought to market? You would have seen the enthusiasm expressed by persons interested in us having access to that gas. That should tell you that this is a very valuable development. What we have done, what we have been doing, is to do everything reasonable and possible to ensure that we can progress towards production. Right? And so far, um, the dial, the needle is moving in that direction. We trust that nothing happens to change it in any other direction. The world is a very, very hostile place right now. You see what's happening in Ukraine. And you see what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Europe, right? So we can't give you any guarantee that nothing will hurt us. Of course we can be hurt, but by the same token. Where, where did COVID come from? We didn't know that we were going to be hurt by a pandemic. Why we say we can stop living because we can get infected? No. We just have to buckle down. We have been doing the work. And at this point in time, we believe that the work that we have been doing and the way we have approached it and the results that we have had and the commitments that we have will see us progressing along the lines that we have been progressing on with these matters. We expect to see um, Manatee continue, which is the closest one. We have open discussions on other fields on the border. Right? Um, we have opened uh, discussions with the whole question of, um, you know, flare gas and so on. So while all this is happening, I just want to make one thing clear. I know, well, in Trinidad and Tobago, people, people say, especially when directed at me, and some go as far as to say that the Prime Minister doesn't care about crime in the country, which is just nonsense. But there are so many things that we have to do at the same time that we can't spend all our time on one thing, even though that thing is big and important. The office of prime minister has to deal with everything at the same time. And because I am not the one dealing with national security does not mean that national security is not being dealt with. Because we've got to make sure that there's, the hospitals are operating. 
We've got to make sure that the teachers are paid. We've got to make sure the children are protected. We've got to make sure the defense forces are water and that they are serviced. We've got to make sure that the foreign debt is paid. You know, so all of that at the same time. So let us not do anything that will hurt any of those oppositions. But understand that we have a number of islands in the fire. And what you want is a responsible government to treat responsibly with them. So we get some success in some areas. We still have challenges in other areas. We stay on the job. And I can tell you, Trinidad and Tobago has a responsible government that very competently engages the issues. That's all I can say. In terms of the conversations you've had with U.S. officials, including the U.S. Vice President, uh, the White House had a readout where the issue of Venezuela uh, was uh, discussed. You mentioned it. Were there any particular concerns or was the U.S. government seeking you to somehow uh, have some say or intervene or make some representation with regard to what is going on in Venezuela? Well, Venezuela featured prominently because, as you know, it's a significant part of the U.S. foreign policy in our region. And obviously, the U.S. have their views, we have our views, and we also have a partnership. And the whole question with respect to Venezuela, Caracas, Washington, Port of Spain, we try to, Trinidad and Tobago's position is that this has to be a partnership. No one point in that triangle has all the solutions, and no one point should cause a problem for the others, whether it is Caracas, so we talked to the Washington, we talked to Caracas. As a matter of fact, Minister Young is off to Caracas when again? Next week. And then Trinidad and Tobago is engaged. And I myself am in the pipeline to go to Caracas sometime in the not too distant future. There's a lot. There's a lot. I can tell you, eh? It is mentally very stressful. But as you all would say, I asked for the job and you gave it to me. So I ain't complaining, right? Speaking about asking for a job, Prime Minister, la, 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 last week Saturday mm -hmm. you hinted that you may not be in politics, um, you know, for quite some um, um, very soon again. Um, would we see you, um, see you contesting in the general election? Uh, the next general election is not in front of us. I give you the assurance that you'll be the first to know when the next general election appears on the horizon. But this is an election year, is it? I heard that. Really? Yeah. I thought it was this year. But, but how, how, how strong it is that you're thinking? Is it this year? Because you have that ability to call it. Yes. Just hold on. That that can't be taken for Having the ability is one thing. Having the common sense is other. Yeah. So, Prior. so will you, will we see you really contesting, or, or are you contemplating now, you know, um, stepping away, you're spending time with your family, as you said? What, how close are we to doing that? Vacation. For the first time in how long? I've been, but no, no, um, my focus at this moment is not on election. My focus is on these very, very weighty matters that have su such serious consequences for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, hopefully, in the next few months, um, a lot of it, certainly um, the U.S. elections in November, our elections, um, what happens in Caracas, there's election there too as well. So this, is a, this year in particular is a very um, turbulent year for Port of Spain, Washington, and Caracas. And those of us who are in leadership in these countries, we just have to ensure that we buckle down and do the best for our people. How are you feeling? You good for another five? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I, I hope that um, I will be good for more than five. But, you know, good, you know, yeah, good to show it to you. <laughs> no, but um, let, uh, seriously, I am, I, I am honored to have this responsibility for my people of Trinidad and Tobago, and I will do it to the best of my ability for as long as I do it. And of course, if I don't do it, somebody else will have to do it. And that's how I see it. I, I do it for as long as it's my responsibility. 
And then, and if you want to ask whether the organization, the PNM, is in a position to continue without me, the answer is certainly. And if you want to ask whether I have ensured that the PNM is in that position, the answer is yes. I didn't only hint that, I spoke that to you all. I mean, I told you in, I mean, in 2020, I told you one of the reasons why I ensured that I was there, God willing, in 2020, was because I had brought so many young people into the government that I felt it was irresponsible of me to just leave them in a pandemic. By the time this term is ended, many of those people would have had 10 years in government. And that augurs well for the administration and the management. To, to succeed you? <laughs> hey, hey, my Lucas. <laughs> hey, my grandson. <laughs> uh, on another note, they, they, they are widows of oh, the paradivers. They, in one of our meeting with you, what are your thoughts on that? I am ensuring that I do not prejudice, I do not prejudice the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I am not, I have not, and I will not play politics with the tragedy at Paria. I will not play politics. If the family wants to meet me as prime minister, I will meet with them, but I will not meet with them in the context of any political outcome of the Paria tragedy. They are family that are, I have a responsibility for them. I'm the Prime Minister of all of Trinidad and Tobago. And if the family wants to meet with me, I will meet with them. But I'm not playing politics with the Paria tragedy. Just one more question, and, and, and it didn't sit well the answer from my colleague here, Jesse. The <coughs> conversation about the Commissioner of Police's uh, competence has switched from her competence to yours, as everything does eventually get blamed, you get blamed for a lot, and it's saying that your continued or your original uh, support of her and our continued support is the real issue, so not necessarily her, but you continue to support. How do you respond to those people? Hey, John? Yes, sir. We talk about this on Tuesday. Are you going to be at that press conference? I will, I, I've just invited all of you and the country right here on Tuesday at 10.30 where we'll talk national security. Okay. Well, the minister and somebody else should be here, and we'll do that too. All things national security, we'll talk about it on Tuesday. Today, I hope you'll talk about the visit to Washington and the elements of that visit. In terms of that visit, is it usual? I'm, I'm just trying to recollect. Is it a normal circumstance? for Prime Minister of Trump to be able to meet with the director of the Central Intelligence Agency in Washington? If we have to, and I was very pleased that I was able to, because we do have interests in common. Given the CIA's questionable history with political leaders, how, how, how does that sit with you? It was very transparent. <laughs> as they tend to be. Right? Okay, thank you all very much, and I'll see you on Tuesday at 10.30. Right? Thank you very much. TDT News, delivering more news at more times to more people. TDT News, reporting on the people, events, and issues that affect your life. TDT News, online and fully interactive. TDT News, nightly at 6. TDT News, committed, accurate, relevant. I'm Renee Sion with another edition of Caribbean Week in Review. Line and Length, the number one cricket program in the West Indies is on TTT. Line and Length brings you up-to-date interviews, analysis and highlights on the game in the region and internationally. 
Plus, there's an added bonus to receive a gift of gear each month with our grassroots program. Go to lineandlength.net to learn more. Line and Length, in association with Massey United Insurance on TTT. You are dearer to me than all the stars. So many wish but never reach. Cause when I'm falling and all the world seems dark. Help me find my peace. O shun mi ba mi ba mi jani. O shun mi ba mi ba ye. O shun mi ba mi ba mi jani. Arubita ye 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 ye. Question I was not ready and it came as a surprise to me. He asked me to map out my destiny. A firefighter, I could have sued and say. Then he asked, I wonder how much that be. Bring the old mask, nothing is outdated. The red or blue tables from my raffle. You ain't sharing, you ain't caring, you ain't happy time to spare. You follow the ways of the world. You ain't guiding, you ain't loving, you ain't giving or forgiving. Oh, you want the kids in life unfold. Trinbago Carnival Origins. Carnival, often referred to as the greatest show on earth. TNT's Carnival is a part of our culture as much as the other elements we identify with as a people. Today, we enjoy a carnival season comprising of numerous cultural competitions, diverse parties, and an influx of tourists. A season that climaxes into two days of masquerading. However, Carnival's roots runs into almost two centuries of Trinbago's history. In 1833, before the abolition of slavery, Africans began adopting their own improvised version of the Carnival balls celebrated by the French at the time. Though a time of merriment, this version of Carnival, which became known as Canboulé, also represented resistance and rebellion against colonialists. These acts of rebellion were depicted as mockeries that primarily embodied an exaggerated iteration of French sentiments. Over time, these depictions led to memorable characters becoming a mainstay in the celebrations such as the Dame Lorraine, which mimicked the formal dress of the French women by exaggerating the padding in the chest and behind, along with wildly elaborate hats and fans. With the end of slavery in 1834, the free populace were now able to openly celebrate carnival and their emancipation through dress, music and dance. And as Trinbago's population became more diverse, so did the carnival, which